Have you heard that Benin, a neighboring African country of Niger, has removed sanctions on Niger? But wait, that's not the end of the story. Just recently, we saw a swift normalization in relations between the two countries that were earlier tense after Niger's coup. That's because Benin had to accept ECOWA's decision to impose sanctions on Niger. However, Benin no longer wants to be a follower of the Western puppet like ECOWAS. Not only that, but the sanctions were costing it millions of dollars every week because goods coming to its port for Niger were being blocked. Since Niger is a landlocked country, it needs Benin for maritime trade. But things did not end here as Benin has gone forward and vowed to construct the pipeline that will make Niger a major oil producer and supplier in the region. What is this pipeline? and how will it change Niger's fate very soon? Let's know about that in this video. Because things are about to change instantly. So, what did Benin do that has shocked the ECOWAS in Nigeria? Benin has officially lifted the suspension on the transit of imported goods headed for Niger through the port of Cotonou. This decision comes in the wake of a five-month period during which Niger faced sanctions imposed by the West African regional bloc, ECOWAS. Initially, Benin decided to go with the ECOWAS and impose sanctions but adjusted later as time passed on. And now, Benin has shown that it will make its own policies, not going with what is decided behind closed doors in the West. As part of the sanctions, ECOWAS implemented measures such as the closure of Niger's border with Benin, causing a significant drop in revenues for Benin due to the interruption of goods transportation to Niger through its ports. Notably, goods designated for Niger make up a substantial 80% of the transit volume at the port of Cotonou. Hence, the drop in the port's revenues was clear. Benin had two choices. Either it could accept letting go of millions of dollars made in revenues by allowing Niger's goods to transit, or it could reject the sanctions and allow the trade to continue as normal. As of now, Benin has chosen the second option. While the suspension at the port of Cardano has been lifted, it's essential to note that the broader sanctions imposed by ECOWAS on Niger remain in effect. The director general of the port, Bart Van Inu, attributes the decision to lift the suspension to the market improvement in operational conditions at the port. This development occurred nearly a week after Benin President Patrice Talon called for the swift re-establishment of relations between Benin and Niger. Both nations share concerns regarding a significant oil pipeline project, which you will know about shortly in the video. But one thing is clear, Benin is in no mood to follow the orders by ECOWAS to impose sanctions on Niger. But why did Niger rely on Benin for its trade? Well, the hard reality is that Niger lacks coastal access, posing a significant challenge making it impossible to access international markets without proximity to a coast. In contrast, Benin's strategically positioned ports, such as Porto Novo, emerged as the closest and most established route for both import and export activities. Earlier, when relations with Nigeria were normal, Niger could use Nigerian ports for trade. But after sanctions, this option ended as well. What's more, centuries-old trade routes, predating European colonization, connected Niger's interior with Benin's coast, fostering exchanges of goods like gold, ivory, and slaves for essential commodities such as salt and textiles. These routes, often under the control of powerful kingdoms like Dahomey, played a crucial role in shaping historical connections between the two regions. The colonial era, marked by French colonization, further deepened this dependency. The development of infrastructure, particularly railways linking Niger's interior to Benin's ports, solidified Niger's role as a supplier of raw materials, including peanuts and cotton, to Benin. In turn, Benin imported finished goods from Europe, perpetuating the colonial economic model. Trade mechanisms evolved across different eras. In the pre-colonial era, caravans navigating trans-Saharan routes were instrumental transporting valuable goods to Benin's ports. Negotiations involved tribute systems and established trade protocols. During the colonial era, railways became the primary mode of transporting bulk goods, with formalized trade through fixed customs duties and agreements. In the post-colonial era, Niger aimed for diversification, 
exploring partnerships with other coastal nations and developing internal infrastructure to reduce dependence on Benin. Depend However, this could not materialize. Niger remained dependent on Benin for trade, and in turn, it opened a business opportunity for Benin. Its port could completely rely on the revenues made from allowing Niger's exports and imports to pass. This struck a delicate balance that could work if things were normal. However, after sanctions, it proved to be a disaster. So, what affected Niger more? Benin sanctions or the sanctions imposed by ECOWAS, Nigeria, and various Western countries collectively? ECOWAS's initial reaction to the coup in Niger stemmed from legitimate concerns about the potential spread of coups in West Africa. Nigeria played a crucial role in shaping this response, notably through its newly elected president, Bola Tinubu, who assumed the ECOWAS chairmanship just two weeks before the coup. Eager to establish himself as a strong leader amid the regional crisis, Tinubu advocated for forceful intervention to reinstate Bazoum, with the consensus among leaders being that Nigeria's substantial military, the largest in West Africa, would lead any military action. However, it appears that both ECOWAS and Tinubu may have gone too far. While the sanctions effectively conveyed disapproval of coups and undoubtedly exerted external pressure on Niger's generals, they also brought unintended consequences affecting both Niamey and Abuja. The sanctions resulted in severe hardship in Niger, with repercussions on Nigeria, disrupting a thriving cross-border economy along the extensive Nigeria-Niger border. This disruption impacted livelihoods, worsened humanitarian challenges, and endangered significant rail and gas projects crucial for regional trade. Despite the intended aim of the ECOWAS sanctions to apply pressure on Niger's de facto military authorities for the reinstatement of Bazoum, this objective remains unachieved. Instead, the widespread consequences of these measures are disproportionately impacting civilians. The ECOWAS sanctions have severed Niger from numerous traditional trading partners, exacerbating long-standing food insecurity, especially among vulnerable groups. While the junta has sustained relations with neighboring Burkina Faso, Chad, and Mali, viewing them as allies due to their military rule, the borders with Benin and Nigeria, key sources for Niger's food and essential imports, remain closed earlier. But now, as Benin has opened borders and allowed Niger's goods to transit, it eased up problems. So, does it mean days of tensions are over for Niger? Well, that's not the case necessarily. Power outages further strain the fragile economy of Niger. Typically, the country imports more than two-thirds of its electricity from its wealthier neighbor, Nigeria, but sanctions have significantly curtailed the supply. Unlike in 2021 following the coup in Mali, when ECOWAS excluded food, electricity, and petroleum products from the punitive economic and financial restrictions, no such exemptions have been extended to Niger. Major cities like Niamey, Maradi, and Zinder are grappling with prolonged blackouts and severe power rationing, prompting many businesses to resort to generators. With fuel in short supply, those unable to secure diesel or bear the generator costs have been compelled to shut down. Regarding whom Nigerians attribute responsibility for this situation, there is little definitive evidence either way. Under a regime like that of the junta in Niamey, gauging public opinion is nearly impossible, and any poll results are, at best, indicative. In August, a survey by the polling firm Premise Data found that 79% of respondents supported the junta and its actions, but the sample size was small and non-representative. Overall, the junta has sought to secure citizen support by framing its power grab as a struggle against France, the former colonial power, which took a firm stance against the generals following the August takeover. However, whether political sentiment aligns with the junta or anti-junta sentiment is suppressed, the sanctions regime has not resulted in overt domestic political pressure on the generals. What's more, since the sanctions are hitting the country hard, the junta has initiated a legal challenge against the imposed sanctions. On November 21, along with six Nigerian organizations and a Niger national, they filed a petition with the ECOWAS Court of Justice in Abuja, urging the lifting of the sanctions. The petitioners argued that ECOWAS has been imposing harsher sanctions on Nigerians compared to those following coups in other member states. In response, 
ECO was contended that the junta is not recognized under the regional bloc's protocol, rendering it ineligible for a hearing by the regional court. The impact of the sanctions extends beyond Niger, affecting Nigeria, which shares a border of approximately 1,600 kilometers with Niger. Nigeria was already grappling with financial challenges before the turbulence in Niger. In October 2022, four months before Nigeria's presidential election, the central bank decided to replace the country's entire stock of Naira bills with new banknotes in just three months, resulting in an unprecedented cash shortage that had Nigerians queuing at banks for days. The sudden currency overhaul proved disastrous, prompting its suspension in March, which was extended indefinitely in November. In May, during his inauguration, President Tinubu, who campaigned on promises to alleviate poverty, terminated long-standing fuel subsidies that had drained $10 billion from the budget in 2022. Petrol prices nearly tripled overnight. The following month, his government abandoned a years-long currency peg, allowing the Naira to adjust to more market-reflective rates. In October, year-on-year -year food inflation rose to 32%. Here's a reminder to please like and share the video and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos on black culture, history, civilization, and identity. Let's continue now. Since August, the sealed border with Niger has intensified challenges in Nigeria, especially impacting millions in the seven northernmost states. This includes individuals employed in agriculture or the informal sector and those reliant on cross-border trade. These states were already grappling with economic difficulties before the coup-related sanctions took hold. Earlier in the year, the UN Food and Agricultural Organization estimated that 3.3 million people in three states in the Northeast region were food insecure, with 2.9 million critically so in the Northwest. The projection indicated that these numbers could escalate to 4.4 million and 4.3 million respectively by the lean season in December without urgent action. This means that much like Benin, which could not afford continuing sanctions on Niger, Nigeria would do the same. When these sanctions hit its economy hard and drag it to a breaking point, they will inevitably be removed. This proves that sanctions on Niger affected the countries imposing the sanctions as well. However, Niger was struggling, trying to survive despite sanctions. But things got out of hand when Benin suspended goods transport to and from Niger to its port. It's because this meant Niger was disconnected from the entire world, as Niger's all imports and exports made their way through Benin. Luckily, now this has been resolved as Benin has removed the sanctions. But what about the oil pipeline everyone is talking about? Well, suspending sanctions was not the only action Benin took. Its president has decided to normalize relations with Niger, no matter what the ECOWAS says. Therefore, Benin and Niger have decided to construct an oil pipeline linking Niger to its neighboring country, Benin. This nearly 2,000-kilometer-long oil pipeline represents a momentous development for Niger, ranked as one of the world's poorest countries. It marks the country's inaugural entry into the international crude oil market, facilitated through the Benin port of Simi. The commissioning ceremony unfolded at the Agadem oil site, situated over 1,700 kilometers from the capital, Niamey, within the desert region of Difa. During the ceremony, Prime Minister Ali Mohamed Lamine Zaina underscored that the proceeds from this initiative would be directed towards ensuring the sovereignty and development of our country. Earlier, the closed border between Niger and Benin, a repercussion of the stringent sanctions imposed by the economic community of West African states, continued to pose a challenge. But now, as Benin has officially removed the sanctions, talks on constructing the pipeline have started. Energy ministers from Mali and Burkina Faso, both expressing support for Niger's new leadership and having undergone military coups in the past two years, were in attendance at the ceremony. Things become interesting when we learn that China is building this pipeline under the supervision of the China National Petroleum Corporation, CNPC. This means no matter what happens and what type of propaganda is spread against the pipeline, it will be completed at all costs. According to Niger's government reports, the total investment in the project amounts to $6 billion with $4 billion designated for oil field development and $2.3 billion allocated for pipeline construction. This 2,000 kilometers long pipeline will connect Niger's Agadem oil field to the Benin port of Simi. 
This historic development positions Niger, one of the world's poorest nations, to venture into the international crude oil market for the first time. This substantial investment has empowered Niger to ramp up its oil production to 110,000 barrels per day, with an official target set to increase to 200,000 barrels per day by 2026. But how will this pipeline change everything for Niger, making it a major power in the region? Niger is ready for its maiden crude oil exports through the recently completed Niger-Benin pipeline in January, as disclosed by Abdurahamane Tiani, the country's military leader, in a televised announcement. Under the pipeline arrangement, Niger is slated to receive 25.4% of the 90,000 barrels per day designated for export. Currently, the country operates a modest oil refinery with a capacity of around 20,000 barrels per day, predominantly catering to the domestic fuel market. Tiani, who assumed power as the head of a military junta in a July coup, articulated the nation's intent to shift towards increased local oil refining, emphasizing the aspiration for a refinery processing Nigerian crude on Nigerian soil. He underscored that Niger has not fully reaped the benefits of its natural resources. Therefore, not only will this pipeline fulfill Niger's energy needs, but it will also allow Niger to be a major crude oil exporter in the international market. This will end all dependency on Nigeria for electricity as Niger will be able to use its crude oil to produce its own electricity. The China National Petroleum Corporation CNPC, plays a crucial role as the developer and operator of the Niger-Benin crude pipeline, representing the company's most substantial cross-border crude oil pipeline investment to date. CNPC secured upstream approval for the project from the Republic of Niger in June 2018 and subsequently finalized the construction and operation agreement with the government of Benin in August 2019. Construction activities, including surface infrastructure, started in September 2019, with the pipeline scheduled for commissioning in 2021. The project aligns with the second phase of development of the Agadem oil field, yielding a total output exceeding 5.5 million tons. The Niger-Benin crude pipeline project, representing the second phase of the Agadem oil field development, involves constructing a new pipeline and related facilities. It will feature a single point mooring system with an anticipated annual export of 4.5 million tons of crude oil. The total length of the new pipeline is designated at 1,950 kilometers, with approximately 1,075 kilometers passing from Niger's territory and the remaining 675 kilometers extending through the Republic of Benin. The project includes nine intermediate stations before reaching the port of Sime, which can deliver up to 90,000 barrels of crude oil per day to the Port Sime Export Terminal on the Atlantic coast in Benin. The construction of the project is expected to stimulate traffic to the port of Cotonou in Benin, with an anticipation of processing up to 300,000 tons of goods once the pipeline becomes operational. That's what allows Benin to benefit from, besides having the option to buy crude oil at a discounted price. But how is the pipeline's construction going? As of now, the pipeline construction is going at full speed. A joint venture led by CNPC is overseeing the development of the Agadem Basin, where CNPC has made 110 discoveries from 137 exploration wells. The Agadem Production Sharing Contract PSC area, is being developed in two phases, with the first phase located adjacent to savanna permit areas. Oil production from the Agadem block, marking the initial phase of development, began in November 2011. The oil is exported to CNPC's Zinder Oil Refining Facility in Southern Niger, producing petrol, diesel, and LPG products for domestic use. The Agadem field is connected to a nearby refinery in Zinder through an approximately 13-inch diameter and 462.5-kilometer-long existing pipeline. It comprises seven stations, including three heating stations, three cleanup stations, and a terminating station. In Gaia, southwest Niger, near the Benin border, Chinese and Nigerian workers are constructing Africa's longest oil pipeline with a projected length of nearly 2,000 kilometers. Over 600 kilometers of the pipeline have already been laid, and Niger aims to commence crude oil exports on the international market from July next year. To ensure the pipeline construction is undisrupted, Niger's military junta has deployed more than 700 soldiers to secure the project. 
This shows how serious Niger's military junta is about the oil pipeline that has the potential to uplift Niger in the region. This initiative, called Niger's biggest investment since gaining independence from France in 1960, marks a significant shift for the country as it strategically delves into oil to fortify its national budget. Niger, historically a major uranium producer, is pivoting to oil as uranium revenues dwindle, with a substantial portion of the national budget dedicated to combating jihadists in the southeast and west. This transition to oil has the potential to contribute a quarter to the country's GDP, surpassing $13.6 billion in 2020, as per World Bank data. Furthermore, it is expected to generate approximately 50% of Niger's tax revenue, a substantial increase from the current figures of 4% and 19%. Kabiru Zachary, the head of the ministry's oil refining division, estimates Niger's oil reserves at around 2 billion barrels. Official forecasts indicate that Niger will achieve a daily oil production of 200,000 barrels by 2026. Now, by leveraging its crude oil, Niger can forge relations with countries that were earlier off-limits. That's how Russia pursued its foreign policy. Despite facing sanctions, the oil diplomacy allowed Russia to continue trade with major world powers. It even offered oil at discounted prices. This proves that if a nation has crude oil, sanctions can be neutralized. That's what Niger's military junta wants. It wants to first stabilize the country and economy to unfold the next plans. After the pipeline has been constructed, Niger will never be the same as it will have the bargaining power in the region. What do you think? Should more African countries normalize their relations with Niger? Isn't it true that after the oil pipeline, Niger could sell its crude oil and become a major power in the region that could bring Western puppets like the Nigerian president accountable? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section right below on how Niger's military junta will leverage from sanctioned suspension. Do you want to watch more videos like this one? If yes, subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon next to it. We have decided to bring videos on something nobody talks about. The black culture, civilization, history, and evidence about how glorious blacks have been. Thanks for watching, and until the next video, stay tuned. Theo.